Hey guys, I am going to be reading Fever of 1793 by Lori Holt Sanderson. So this is going to be chapter one. Chapter one, August 16th, 1793. The city of Philadelphia is perhaps one of the wonders of the world. Lord Adam Gordon, Journal Entry, 1765. I woke to the sound of a mosquito whining in my left ear and my mother screeching in the right. Rouse yourself this instant! Mother snapped open the shutters and heat poured into our bedchamber. The room above our coffee house was not large. Two beds, a washstand, and a wooden trunk with frayed leather straps nearly filled it. It seemed even smaller with Mother storming around. Get out of bed, Matilda, she continued. You're sleeping the day away. She shook my shoulder. Polly's late and there's work to be done. The noisy mosquito darted between us. I started to sweat under the thin blanket. It was going to be another hot August day. Another long, hot August day. Another long, hot, boring, wretched August day. I can't tell who is lazier, Polly or you, Mother muttered as she stalked out of the room. When I was a girl, we were up before the sun. Her voice droned on and on as she clattered down the stairs. I groaned. Mother had been a perfect girl. Her family was wealthy then, but that didn't stop her from stitching entire quilts before breakfast or spinning miles of wool before tea. It was the war, she liked to remind me. Children did what was asked of them, and she never complained. Oh, no, never. Good children were seen and not heard. How utterly unlike me. I yawned and stretched and then snuggled back onto my pillow. A few minutes, more minutes rest. That's what I needed. I'd float back to sleep, drifting like Blanchard's giant yellow balloon. I could see it. The winter's day, the crowds on the rooftops, the balloon tugging at its ropes. I held my breath. Would the ropes break? The devilish mosquito attacked, sinking its needle nose into my forehead. Ow! I leapt from my bed and thunk, cracked my head on the sloped ceiling. The ceiling was lower than it used to be. Either that or I had grown another inch overnight. I sat back down, wide awake now, my noggin sporting two lumps. One from the ceiling, one from the mosquito. No balloon trips for me. To work then. I got to my feet and crossed the room, ducking my head cautiously. The water in the wash basin was cloudy and the face cloth smelled like old cheese. I decided to clean up later, perhaps next December. A squeaky mouse dashed by my toes, followed by a flash of orange fur named Silas. The mouse ran at the corner, its claws scratching desperately on the floorboards. Silas pounced. The squeaking stopped. Oh, Silas, did you have to do that? Silas didn't answer. He rarely did. Instead, he jumped up on Mother's quilt and prepared to pick apart his breakfast. Mother's best quilt. Mother abhorred mice. I sprang across the room. Get down, I commanded. Silas hissed at me, but obeyed, leaping to the floor and padding out the door. Matilda, Mother's voice called up the stairs. Now! I made a face at the doorway. I had just saved her precious quilt from disaster. disaster. But would she appreciate it? Of course not. No more dawdling. I had to get dressed. I fastened my stays and badly embroidered pocket over the white shift that I slept in. Then I stepped into my blue linen skirt. It nearly showed my ankles. Along with the ceiling getting lower, my clothes were shrinking too. Once dressed, I faced the rather dead mouse and wrinkled my nose. Picking it up by the tail, I carried the corpse to the front window and leaned out. My city, Philadelphia, was awake. My heart beat faster and my head cleared. Below the window, High Street teemed with horsemen, carriages, and carts. I could hear Mrs. Henning gossiping on her front stoop and dogs barking at a pig running loose in the street. The sound of the blacksmith's hammer on his anvil reminded me of Polly, our tardy serving, serving girl. That's where she was, no doubt, in the blacksmith shop. I'm Matthew, the blacksmith's son. I didn't like it there. The roaring furnace, sparks crackling in the air, the sizzle of hot metal and cold water. It all reminded me of that unmentionable place the preachers like to go on about. My favorite place was the waterfront. I squinted eastward. The rooftop of the state house where the congressman was visible, but the August haze and dust from the street made it impossible to see farther than that. On a clear day, I could see the masts of ships tied up at the wharves on the Delaware River. I promised myself a secret visit to the docks later, as soon as Polly arrived to distract Mother. A 
few blocks south lay the Walnut Street prison where Blanchard had flown that remarkable balloon. From the prison's courtyard it rose, a yellow silk bubble escaping the earth. I vowed to do that one day, slip free of the ropes that held me. Nathaniel Benson had heard me say it, but he did not laugh. He understood. Perhaps I would see him at the docks, sketching a ship or seagulls. It had been a long time since we'd talked. But before I went anywhere, there was a dead mouse to dispose of. I couldn't throw it into High Street. It might spook one of the horses. I crossed the room and opened the back window overlooking the garden. Maybe Silas would smell his treat out there and get a decent breakfast after all. I flung the corpse as far as I could, then hurried downstairs before Mother boiled over. Please come back soon for chapter two.